The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Um, okay, so this is our plan. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about writing. We're going to practice some writing with uh, the examples that you uploaded, uh, and then some other examples that are not yours. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about hosting. And then if we have time, I don't know if we will at the end, we'll do a little bit of hosting practice. But part of the hosting practice will come with the writing practice. It's, it's hard to separate them. Um, I'm going to talk for like maybe 10 minutes about writing, uh, and then we'll just get right into the practice. I'm going to like overload you with a bunch of guidelines or rules or however you want to think about it. Uh, don't worry about remembering them or writing them down, but we'll come back to them all as we do the practice, because that's really how you learn is by doing. Um, this is one way to write. It's kind of how, how I approach writing. You start with an idea, like, hey, it'd be great to have a video about whatever x. Um, and then the explosion phase is the, I'm going to think about everything that could possibly relate to this idea. I'm going to write it all down. I think you saw an example of that with Elizabeth's snot brainstorm. Brainstorm is another word for it. Um, and then from there, you sort of go outward, and then you distill it down to the essence. Like, what is the actual point of the video? Who, what, uh, how, why, where is sometimes important, but not usually. Um, and then the stuff that we're going to talk about today, this is the, the writing. Um, piece of it. So when you write a script, you want to pay attention to structure. So uh, what do you talk about first? What's in the middle? How do you end it? That kind of thing. Tone. Are you going for funny? Are you going for dry? Are you going for um, informal? Are you going for formal? Um, jargon. You want to generally you try and avoid jargon, if, especially if you're shooting for like high school, middle school. That that um, that. Range. By the way, uh, it's ironic that I'm using the word jargon. Um, jargon is a technical language, which jargon is itself a technical word. So that's sort of an ironic thing there. Um, visuals, you always want to write the script. Because video is a weird medium. I mean, you've got the image, and then you've got the soundtrack. And you want to make sure that they are related and not don't duplicate each other. So that is a, a trick that we'll, we'll get into. I saw, I was reading some of your examples, <clears throat> and there are um, particular uh, uh, sentences where this is going to be really important. So if I don't talk about that on my own, remind me. Um, metaphors and jokes. <clears throat> uh, it's really hard to be funny. Um, so uh, if, you, if you think you can and you want to try, then I'd say go for it. But uh, generally, I try and avoid jokes. Um, metaphors are similar. It's, it's kind of hard to write a good metaphor. Do, you, do we all know what a metaphor is, by the way? I showed them the plants video yesterday. OK, cool. Um, and uh, so those are sort of the, the, the stuff on the left is in every video you've got to pay attention to. The stuff on the right, the metaphors and the jokes are sort of advanced. Anyway, then once you sort of get your first draft together, have, you, you explode, you distill down to your essence, then you condense it and you, uh, you write your script. And this doesn't happen once. This happens many, many times. Typically, a script will go through uh, between four and like 12 revisions before we actually shoot it, up to and including uh, we're rewriting like five minutes before we shoot. Because you say it out loud, and something just doesn't sound right, um, and you feel like you have to change it. So this is generally how my writing process works. Other people do it completely differently. This is sort of an MIT approach. It's very sort of structured and logical. But it doesn't have to be this way. If you don't want to write like this, you absolutely don't have to. Um, the first writing guideline, this is in addition to the, the flow chart, is, and I think you guys talked about this a little bit already, um, know your audience and write for them. And I've had th this note down there, not necessarily to them. So you know, most of the videos that you're going to be working for are aimed at people younger than, than you. Um, and sometimes people are a lot, longer, a lot younger than you. I mean, maybe even down to like sixth, seventh grade middle school. Uh, so you want to write to their level of education, but not necessarily talk as if you were talking to a middle schooler. Uh, does anyone know what I mean by that distinction? I'll cold call if people don't speak up. Like don't baby talk. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Don't baby talk. So give me an example of like, pick a sentence, any sentence. You can read it off the 
intellectual property form in front of you if you want. But give me the non, the like, just the ver the regular version, and give me the baby talk version, just so we have a sense. I choose to have my name associated. Uh, you choose to have your name associated. The materials are associated with that. Baby talk. So you maybe want to choose to make <laughs> maybe it might. Be. No, that's exactly right. And you guys notice that it's funny when he does that. Like, it's, there's just something ridiculous about, um, you call it baby talk or talking down to your audience or something, that you immediately don't pay attention to what he's saying. You pay attention to how he's saying it, and you've lost your audience immediately. So that's a really important distinction. Um, by the way, this holds true if you're just interacting with kids anyway. Um, most kids are smarter than we give them credit for, and, you know, you know, pe people baby talk kids all the time, but if you just straight talk to them, you'll be surprised at the kind of responses that you get. Um, rule number two, or guideline, sorry, number two, is write it like you would say it because you will be saying it. And what I mean here is your script is a draft, and it will always be a draft. You will never have a final script because nobody's going to log on to the internet and read your script. What they're going to do is hear you say the words that are on your script. So. Even if a sentence is great on paper and you read it in your head and it sounds awesome, if when you say it out loud it sounds weird or it's, not, it's hard to understand or whatever, then it doesn't matter how great it looked on paper, it's not an effective sentence. Um, and we will come back to, this is the, the most important thing we'll talk about today, we'll come back to that when we, when we do the practice. Um, this is another version of the previous slide. When you, and, and you guys are, all know this because you read scientific journal articles and stuff, when you read that kind of text, it's very dense, it's extremely well structured and logically laid out, it has a lot of jargon, it's very precise, um, there's very little ambiguity, uh, and it's understated and it's elegant, meaning like, it, they, usually people take the fewest possible words to say something, and that means using long and complex words, um, and it is beautiful to read, it's great English. Uh, but if you try and read it out loud and you do it on video, you, again, you'll lose your audience instantly. It's just as bad as baby talk. Um, when you talk, you, you know, people talk in, people are very repetitive. They say, uh, they say, um, they, uh, like I just did. They um, don't really use fancy words. If, if their audience doesn't understand, they say, oh, stop. They stop and they try another approach. Um, it's a lot more freeform, a lot more inconsistent, a lot fluffier. Uh, and that's what you want to shoot for because you will be on screen talking to the camera as if that camera is another person. Uh, and so that's kind of what, that's the, the write it like you say it. That's what I mean when I say write it like you would say it. Um, another, and I think this is the last guideline, is um, you really want to be accurate because obviously you don't want to say things that are wrong in your videos. Uh, but accuracy is not the same thing as detail. So. This is the difference between, going back to the last slide, um, being extreme, like being very, very, very precise usually requires a lot of detail. If you want to say exactly what you mean, it probably will take you a couple sentences to say it. But if you want to be accurate, that is going to, and especially if you want to be accurate for a short five minute video, that's going to mean leaving information out. And that's okay. Um, the, the test that I like to, subject scripts to is, can an eighth grader understand it? If so, great. And can a PhD in the subject matter of that script read the script, and if their reaction is, wow, this is surprisingly accurate, then you've done a good job. Um, and that is, that's all. That's it for my rules. Um, hopefully that was less than 10 minutes. Uh, what I want to do now is put these rules into practice. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to start with a quote that uh, is not one of yours, and then we'll move into your scripts. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let me pick one. Uh, no. No. Let's do the first one. Um, okay, so let's see. Everyone take a second and just read this. So you'll notice the citation. This is from a paper. 
uh, it's written English. Um, can someone just shout out some of the rules that would make this bad for speaking and reading aloud? In fact, why don't we, let's actually read this aloud just to see how it sounds. So, um, anthropogenic CO2 emissions are contributing to global climate change and could negatively impact our way of life if serious action is further delayed. Okay, so what rules are we breaking? Or what guidelines are we breaking? I think just hearing it out loud it seems kind of like if you were presenting it to some, someone, it'd be a long sentence. And it's very statement. It's not like a, it's not conversational. It's not like you're, you know, so it's, it's not written like you would speak. Exactly. Wes? Yeah. The word anthropogenic is difficult to hear and remember. Exactly. It's also, it's also jargon. It means um, human made. It is, a, it is a very passive. What do you mean by that? Explain. Well, if further delayed, I mean, what you really mean is this, is, this, this could be troublesome. This is bad, right? Or it could be bad, right? But the way of stating it as further delayed is a very, um, it's in a very, not a very active way of saying the same thing. And um, what, so here's another interesting thing. Negatively impact. Those are, you know, those are not difficult words. It's easy to understand what they mean. But let's think about that for a second. So what does negatively impact our way of life mean in colloquial language? What would you say to someone if you were going to say, in 100 years, climate change will do what? Yeah. Will it negatively impact our way of life? No, it's going to kill us all. You know, that's the, the sort of the real life subtext of this sentence. What else? You have to, I mean, you wait to the end of the sentence before you get the payoff, right? You don't even, you don't understand what the point of the sentence is until uh, you get to negatively impact our way of life if serious action is further delayed. And really, you don't understand, I mean, the, the point is, we need to act now. That's what the sentence is saying. If we act later, we're screwed. Uh, and you don't get that until if serious action is further delayed. So yeah, this, the, the payoff really comes at the very, very end. It's a fun exercise to eliminate all of the adjectives and look at the nouns and verbs, right? Just take a second and see if you can do that. It actually makes it really simple. Emissions are contributing to change and um, impact, like, like picking out all of the things, it suddenly simplifies everything. There's a lot of descriptors in there that are very distracting. So now that we've done this, uh, let's rephrase it as if we were saying it to someone on camera. Or what if just to someone in general? Okay, yeah, to someone in general. Say it to me. Anyone. If we don't act now, if our CO2 emissions are just more time. Right? Another bird. And made CO2 emissions are hurting us. Okay. Another. Yeah. Um, humans create CO2 emissions. We must act now or suffer. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> we must act now or suffer. That's good. Anyone else? Someone who hasn't said anything yet. Okay, um, that is, so the point I'm trying to make by having five or six of you say it each a different way is that there's no one right way to, to, to write a script. Um, there are lots of interesting, engaging, dramatic ways to say the same thing. Uh, and we are going to get into that now with your examples, which we're going to spend considerably more time on. Um, oh, before you move on. Jordan. Yes. Um. So it's always an interesting challenge balancing avoiding being too jargony and ending up babying your audience, right? Like there's no reason why you can't say the words 
climate change, um, even though those are technical terms, or even, what was it, anthro? Anthropogenic. Anthropogenic. Um, I mean, we talk about this with science allied scripts all the time. The way you deliver a word, for instance, uh, can, can help a lot with conveying what was the word that we had in I mean, if you want to, if you're going to use that same word four or five times throughout the script and it's an important word and it's like relates to a demo or something, if there's some reason for you to use jargon, it's okay to define it as long as you just define it like you would, you know, to another person. Like you say, anthropogenic uh, means, um, you know, human made. And then you go on and use it later on. That's fine. You don't want to do that like six times in the video and define six different words because then you overload your audience. But that's true. There is, you know, if you find yourself having to say human made, man made, woman made, like if you ha like are stretching to try and find alternatives to to a word five or six times that you could just define and get it over with, that's fine. I would limit that probably to like one or two words a video, you, or you, one or two words per like three, four minute video. And the other reason why it's really important to actually do the exercise of reading your script out loud or uh, even just flipping your script over and not looking at it and trying to describe the concepts to the person next to you is that a very bad habit of mine, which I am constantly finding and annoy George, George with a lot, is that I get very newscastery. So I may end up having a script that sounds good when you say it out loud, um, but it sounds like you're a reporter talking about the latest news update at MIT. You know, CO2 emission, can you about do that yep. quote? Yeah, like the middle part isn't actually that crazy to say out loud. It's contributing to global climate change and could negatively impact our way of life, right? Like that doesn't sound too crazy to say out loud, but it sounds like someone is saying that in the context of I'm here at the MIT Course 1 lab where researchers are finding a way to prevent global climate change from negatively impacting our life, right? It doesn't sound like I'm just talking to Nathan being like a lot of man-made emissions are harming, you know, our everyday life or something like that. I also wouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah, there, there is, I mean, the, the way you write influences the way you're going to naturally say something. And you could say the sentence both ways. So you could say it, you know, anthropogenic CO2 emissions are contributing to global climate change and could negatively impact our way of life if serious action is further delayed. And that sounds like the 7 o'clock news, right? You could say it, you know, you could say it like this. Look, anthropogenic CO2 emissions are contributing to global climate change, and that could really negatively impact our life if we don't do something right now. I mean, they're, they're, it's basically the same line, but it's said two completely different ways. And uh, it's, it's much harder to say a line like this naturally, um, but it's possible. So the way you write can, can impact how you end up saying something, and that's important too. We will, you know, when, whoever of you ends up shooting with us in the last week of January, we are going to guaranteed say, no, try that again, it sounds too new, newscastery. Because the, and this is a style choice, but for Science Out Loud, we, it's not news. We don't want it to come across like, you know, here at MIT, we're talking to you about whatever. Because MIT already has a news office, they do that well. Um, our goal is different. And so, it, you know, that, that's making that style choice consciously from the beginning is important. Um, but if you want to write like a newscaster, I mean, if you're writing for a news show, if the point of the show is news, then this, that could be perfectly fine. Later for hosting, yeah. Um, it might actually be fine to show that now while we're talking about it. Um, let me find it. Yep, here we go. Uh, oh, yeah. Here we go. You guys know who Ira Glass is? This American Life. Um, he's a radio. He's a radio personality. He's been doing this for many, many years. This is totally different. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to play you a, a clip of tape from from my eighth year. It's not such a long way from the local grocery store to the international debate over whether sorghum and meat production are causing corn to decline in Latin America. There's a general air of prosperity here partly thanks to Mexican imports of U.S. grains, which helped boost our farm economy. Mexico is now one of our biggest grain customers, buying a half billion to a billion dollars worth every year. 
including corn to feed its people and sorghum to feed its livestock. Like, what am I talking about? Like, I don't even understand. Like, I wrote this. I don't even understand what it is. And like, and, um, and, and, okay, also, like, like every part of this is, is ill-conceived, okay? Um, like, like, the writing is horrible. You can't even follow what I'm talking about. And then the performance, like, okay, just a little tip if you're, you know, performing for broadcast. You don't underline every third word for emphasis because it sounds really unnatural. What you want to do is you want to talk the way people normally talk. Um, this helps cut our own trade deficit and benefits everyone in the U.S. economy. But in Mexico, this policy has led to fewer tortillas for the poor and unappetizing tortillas for everyone else. Again, like, this is like the most moronic kind of, like, you know, it doesn't mean anything. And, and it's hard. It's actually kind of an interesting story, which I'll say to you in a sentence, which is, um, because Mexico produces a lot of stuff that they ship to the United States, tomatoes and all sorts of really like wonderful food that we eat here, um, they don't make enough corn for their own people. That's the story. So we, because for us to get really great tomatoes or semi-great tomatoes year round, basically Mexicans eat worse. That's the story. And it's kind of an interesting idea, right? Like that's actually sort of like a cool idea executed in the worst possible way. So he's talking about two things there. The, the first is the, how he wrote the story, and the second is how he delivered the story, right? So in the second part of the clip where he, where he tells you the point of the story in like two sentences, and you can actually understand what he's saying, that's a writing issue. And then the point that he makes about, you know, don't underline every third word, um, uh, once you hear that, like li if you listen to the local news or even the national news, I mean, once you hear that, you can't unhear that. It's a, it's incredible how pervasive that tone is, um, because it makes people sound very important and official when they choose certain words to underline and deliver correctly. And you know, like that is something that is, it, it's fine for the news because it has a purpose, but it's just, I mean, you know, it, it's, I think it's terrible and. You know, <laughs> Ira Glass does too. Um, if you listen to his show, is this it's called This American Life, um, and if you could just listen to the first like three four minutes of any show, it's a great example of of, of really good hosting. Um, Marketplace is another show that has a similar style and feel to it that's good to listen to. Um, and then uh, every every thing. I think eight minutes past the hour or something, NPR, or every hour, NPR goes back to their local news stations so you can hear the difference between newscastery delivery and natural delivery. It's a really good exercise. Like I say, once you, once you hear it, you can't unhear it. Um, okay, so let's go back to writing. Um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to have, I picked, I think, three or four scripts at random. And uh, I'm going to have whoever wrote the script come up here and read it, and then we're going to do a group critique of the script. This is a humbling experience. We are going to say, um, we're, we're going to point out ways that your script has been better, but that's okay. That's how you get better. Um, and uh, it's an experience that we will go through again and again. Well, I won't because uh, I won't be here, but you will with Elizabeth again and again throughout the rest of the course, and especially in January, um, because we are going to be very anal about, you know, does this make sense? Does this convey the idea we want it to convey? Uh, does it do it effectively? So this is, I think, going to be your first experience with that. So who, who wrote that? By the way, I picked random, all right, come on up. I picked random sections of the script uh, to, to talk through. Do you, want, do you want him to put on a mic? Do you want do it, him to wear a mic? Yes? Does it matter? OK. All right, come on. What's your name again? David. David, nice to meet you. I'm sorry you're going first. <laughs> All right, so stand up there. You can read the text here. Um, deliver it like you would like you would deliver it if you know you were being recorded, which you are being recorded. And I'm going to sit in your place, and we're all going to have a conversation about it. Okay, so uh, when I was writing this, I was actually writing on my bed. Then, like I was sitting next to my roommate, so I was actually kind of shy about reading out loud. So actually, I tried to read it out loud, but I read it like semi-internally, okay. so maybe that's why some sentences would sound a bit odd. That's okay, let's, no judgment yet, let's just, let's get it out there. Okay. Yeah, no judgment ever, <laughs> it's the same space. Okay, so, so my topic is about uh, why some people, why do some people handle cold better than others? So what I was interested in is that, why is it that some people are more fearful about the cold, that they'd rather die than be caught outside without all the winter gear, masks and all, while others can wear one layer for a morning drop? Actually, I saw that this 
uh, yesterday morning. And what makes all the difference? So to understand this, we first need to find out how our body reacts to cold. The first point is that our body changes the way it burns energy more efficiently. We actually burn more carbohydrates through our metabolic system to generate more heat. Imagine a giant furnace within our bodies. As winter starts to come, we throw more bits of carbohydrates and store energy to burn and create more heat to warm up our bodies. Then we kill pictures of furnace and burning stuff. Okay, great. Okay, you can come back and sit down. Thank you. Excellent. Um, go ahead. I want to point out something that actually has nothing to do with writing. Uh, when you were very similar to how um, there is a there is a newscastery tone to de to deliver things, especially when you're reading off a teleprompter, there is also a reading tone to deliver things versus you know reading something out loud versus saying it to someone. And when you got to the end of your first paragraph, so you said, um, you know, without all the winter gear on, mask and all, while others can wear one layer for a morning jog, I saw that yesterday actually. Did anyone else notice how when he switched from reading to talking, you instantly snapped to attention? Because, I mean, here his focus is there, and then when he switches over to, oh, I saw that yesterday, by the way, he looks at you all, he makes that connection with you, and you respond instantly, right? So that's something that is maybe better we talk about when we talk about hosting, but since you, since you did it right there, I wanted to point it out. Uh, okay, so now, um, in one sentence, someone summarized the sort of main point of this part of the script for me. Without, without rereading it. Sorry, that was a crucial piece of information. Don't read it again. Carbohydrates, generate heat. OK. Ah. Carbohydrates are the fuel to generate heat. OK. Yeah, that's a little more specific. Um, someone else have a different sentence they were thinking of? Yeah. Um, our bodies process carbohydrates differently, so we um, react differently to the cold. OK, cool. Um, what technique is used here to explain how we process carbohydra carbohydrates? Metaphor? Explain. Where? The giant furnace within our bodies. Does it work? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it Makes you know makes you understand something that's technical and scientific in a more uh, relatable way. What do you mean by rela relatable? Well, um, you know, if you have a like a oil furnace at home and you're used to that thing cranking on in the winter, then you can kind of relate to that. Right. So your body is a an incredibly complex piece of machinery. Uh, it is basically unlike anything else that we're used to in our world, right? But uh, a furnace, right? An oil furnace or a, even a fireplace or whatever, something that burns stuff, is something that every, your, your audience pretty much you can count on will have seen that. So relating this very complex piece of machinery to something that's much simpler is a great way to clue your audience in immediately on you know, what, what's going on. Um, the, we can talk about metaphors more later and like what the tricky parts of metaphors are, but what else here makes this effective? What else makes the, um, what else makes you want to listen, makes you interested to know more? What techniques? Yeah. So the first paragraph is all questions. That's all it is. It's just sentences of questions. So how does that, why is that useful? Why does that help? Exactly, and that's a really common technique. You start off the question with, you start off the video, excuse me, with either one or more questions. Uh, what else is effective here? I mean, the questions themselves work. It's not that you just pose. You could have posed much bigger questions, like, why, why do I get cold? Right. That's not a really compelling question. But it's a the second question. Why is it that? Some people are so fearful of the cold that they would rather be caught dead than go outside. And when you said, like, I just saw this outside, I mean, I see it all the time. I see it outside all the time, too. Um, so the, the 
questions themselves immediately jump into relating to the viewer. And it's something that, that uh, is a common, I mean, you know, having a good, we didn't talk about like, your idea should be good, right? Um, but having a good idea is an important part of making an interesting and readable script. And this is something that we've all experienced. I mean, you walk around MIT and you see people walking around with shorts in the, what it's, the weather outside is like 12 degrees outside or whatever. Um, and you think, my god, they must be insane. Um, but no, maybe they actually don't feel cold like we do. And that, that is something that is, um, it's one of those things that you see a lot and you don't really process it. But when you really stop to think about it, you're like, wow, that is really bizarre. I want to know more. So it, you're right. It's not just asking questions in and of itself, but it's what are those questions and do they point you somewhere interesting? What else is effective here? There's a we right there that I feel like is absolutely essential. Which, which one? Right in the very middle of the very of the page. There is like middle, 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 middle. Mm -hmm. To understand this, we first need to find out how our body reacts to the cold. That we I think is so essential because if it were a you or a me, it wouldn't work. But the we is very appropriately engaging. What does it do? It it means that you and I together are gonna be so I'm not gonna tell you, but we're gonna explore this together. Right. And that's like the perfect tone for this piece. Yeah. You are leading your audience on an adventure of understanding. I mean, you're the guide because you're on camera, but you're bringing them with you versus, you know, I'm just going to open your head and dump this information in your head and then you're going to know it. That's not what this is. This is an odyssey of exploration that we're going to go on together. Anything else that we want to point out is effective? OK, uh, what could be improved? Um, I think the pacing uh, will make it easier to, uh, for, for the host to read. So just have less commas, but maybe more periods, kind of split it up into shorter sentences. Mm -hmm. So there's, you don't have to keep that in your head for a long time. Right, yeah, the sentences are, do get kind of long. Um, the last paragraph is just two sentences, and then the middle question in the, in the first paragraph is a very long sentence. So I agree. Um, that is one of the, that's one of the just the, the default patterns that you fall into when you're writing something without, you know, when you're thinking of something in your head, you tend to think in sort of long, unbroken streams of thought, and that tends to manifest itself on the page. Um, whereas when you talk, usually uh, there, there may not be, it may not be sentences in the traditional sense of like, okay, I'm going to stop talking now, there's a period, and now I'm going to start again. But you do have pauses in your speech that let your audience understand what's going on, and you can count those as sentences. What else? Maybe putting the metaphor before the scientific part, like mentioning the giant furnace, yeah, picturing the giant furnace as before mentioning the So give us a, um, uh, give us a version of how you would imagine that would go. Imagine a giant furnace in the winter burning coal and charcoal to generate it. Now imagine the body, your metabolic system, as a giant furnace, and then the of coal and charcoal as carbohydrates and food. Yeah, great. That's, a, that's an excellent point. So the way this script is written, you have uh, the sort of the simple answer, the simple technical uh, answer that has no metaphor comes first, and then you have the metaphor. But the way that, remind me your name? Kenneth. Kenneth. The way that Kenneth said it is, OK. We're going to start simple. We're going to start with something you know, a giant furnace. Got that in your head? Great. Now, imagine that your body is that furnace. And instead of coal, you've got sugar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you build the metaphor like that. Um, and that is, that's sort of the principle of start small, start easy, start with something you know, and then build layer by layer on that. Um, and that is something that is not one of my rules, but easily could be. Um, it's a great. Everywhere except the very first sentence of the video, it's a great technique to make sure that your audience is caught up with you all the time. And I say everywhere except the first bit because the exception is that you know, if you want to start with a compelling hook, uh, you might start completely out of order and then come back to something later in the video just for the purposes of hooking your audience and, and getting them through the first 10 seconds. Um, but other than that, that, that sort of expansion, I, I sort of look at it as a funnel, like you start really you know, simple and then work your way out to complicated. 
Uh, what else? I'm not really sure whether you need the sentence, the middle sentence, in fact. Which one? This one? Yeah. Let's try it. So give us a read. Read the last few lines here, and then go right into the. Why don't you go into Kenneth's version of it? So read the last couple of lines here, and then go into the furnace, and we'll see how it sounds. OK. So others can wear one layer or more layers for the morning job. What makes all the difference? So our body changes. Oh, sorry. Uh, what makes all the difference? Imagine a giant furnace without, within our bodies. Our bodies changes and burns energy. More. Great. That's perfect. So. Uh, I would agree with you. I think you're absolutely right. I don't think we need the middle sentence. Because you're asking a question, and then you go right into this image. And it's clear that you're not immediately answering the question, right? Um, because imagine a giant furnace is not the answer to what makes the difference, right? Um, <clears throat> but it's clear that from your tone, the way you said it, so you say, what's the difference? Well, imagine your body is a giant furnace. So the way that you say something uh, can. Uh, Essentially, you're, you're saying this sentence in the tone of your voice. So you don't actually need to say that sentence out loud. Great. Anything else we can eliminate, by the way? What can we cut? I think we already mentioned it. Um, but the second sentence, uh, I think you can say that uh, a little less worried. Give it a shot. So why do people hate the cold? Um, that they rather uh, die than be caught outside without all their winter clothes on. I, I don't know. So you're, the way you're doing it is to sort of piecemeal try and chop out certain words, right? But yeah. take a step back, look at the meaning of yeah, like look at the meaning of the sentence, reformulate it, and just say it as if you were saying it to me. Actually, just, do say it to me. So why do we hate the cold? Why do some people have to bundle up and others don't have to wear as much clothes or something like that? Yeah, I think you're onto something. Like, why do you walk around on a cold winter's day? Why, why are some people bundled up and some people wearing shorts? What's the deal? Right? That's a much shorter way of saying essentially that. There is a theatricality in the, in the way that the, the, the first paragraph is written. Um, that you lose by changing it to the to the shorter version, but that comes at the uh, at the from the benefit of you know you're getting into the material faster. Uh, but there is a trade-off there. Yes. Oh, you can also accomplish like all you say in extra detail with your images. So if you show an example of someone bundled up with all the layers, and then a jogger with barely anything on their shorts, then you have all the content that was in that sentence, but you're using the rest of the medium that you have to work with. You reminded me of the thing that I was going to talk about. Thank you. That's, that's exactly what I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, so, uh, and this is really, really, really easy to forget when you're writing a script, is that uh, there's going to be a whole other layer of information that is available to you, uh, is available to your audience in the final product. So to the extent that you can, um, I would absolutely encourage use of visuals that are complementary to the script. So the way that I, I don't have the slides for this, but um, let's say that you wanted to show a synapse. You guys know what a synapse is? The part in your brain where, um, where neurotransmitters go. So you've got this, this. Uh, and then, OK, so this is one nerve. This is another nerve. This is just the space in between the nerves. Um, and these dots are chemicals that this nerve is transmitting to this nerve. These uh, sort of like Poseidon spears uh, are uh, receptors for these chemicals. Um, now, the way that I said that, notice how I, you know, if you were to write down what I just said, these dots, this nerve, this space, but this area is the space between the nerve, you'd have absolutely no idea what I was talking about without the image, right? Whereas if you didn't have this image and you were just writing a script trying to explain what a synapse is, you would have to say, uh, a synapse is the space between two nerves. Uh, one nerve releases chemicals 
uh, that, trans that, that cross that space and get captured by receptors on the other nerve, and that's how one nerve transmits data from, from uh, that's how data is transmitted from one nerve to another, right? So if you're writing a script without the visuals in mind, you can very easily fall into the trap of doing what I just did and writing, writing a script that stands alone. Whereas if you're thinking images, it's going to be mostly like, look at this, check this out, this spaghetti-shaped thing, those dots, that kind of language. And that's totally OK and even encouraged when you're doing video. Um, so that, and that's exactly what you said. Another example is to basically talk in general terms and put specific visuals that complement the script. You were going to say something. Yeah, just that it's not just that someone can wear less clothes. It's that they're comfortable wearing less clothes. And to me, that's an important concept that we can't lose in that first paragraph. Because um, like my husband's like this, where he can be wearing you know, half the clothes, and he's happy that way. right? It's one thing to wear less clothes and be miserable. But it's another thing to be comfortable with that choice. right? Like I see students on campus without shoes on, and I'm like, what's going on there? Right? But, but, like, but the fact that they, you know, it, it's one thing to wear less clothes and be shivering and cold and miserable, but it's another thing to have less clothes and actually be and following that even further, that gets you to, I just had you know, a question in my mind. Like, let's say you took two people, um, one who can wear shorts in the dead of winter and one who has to be completely bundled up. If you transport them into the Antarctic or the Arctic, where it's, I don't know, pick a really cold temperature, sub-zero, sub and just let them stand there for, um, you know, like naked for like 20 days, who dies first, right? Is it that? Is it the person's comfort, or are they actually better adapted to survive in the cold? Um, which is a really interesting distinction, because I mean, if someone's comfortable in the cold, but they're still going to die at the exact same time, then like, yeah, okay, comfort is great, but we haven't, as a species, adapted to better, you know, overcome the cold. Whereas if it's really your body is substantially different. Um, in, a, in a way that could help the human race survive the next ice age, that's cool. So that's a really interesting point. And that's taking the familiar and making it, Chris was talking about that the other day, it's taking an instance that you see and a question that maybe you very fleetingly have, which is how is it that some people don't have to put on a huge winter jacket and can walk outside in the snow fine, whereas I have to layer up it's taking that familiar question and slowly building out to this like pretty epic, you know, concept of like are certain people within our human race like better adapted for total catastrophe than others, right? <laughs> like I'm not saying that you have to go that route, but I mean I think that um, that's why people watch some of these viral videos, right? Because it takes the familiar and makes it unfamiliar. It also, I mean. Not to totally go a totally different route, but a question that this could go into is, you know, are skinny people versus fat people, like, does it have anything to do with your physical being or is it your chemical being that makes you be able to handle the situation better? And can you change that? Or is it just how you're built? But if you tighten this first part up, it leaves you the room to explore the really cool questions, right? Like we. We could easily cut all this text down into half, half its length, right? Why do some people handle the cold better than others? How is it that this person is wearing shorts in the winter is fine, whereas this person is wearing like five jackets? What's like, what's making the difference? Well, imagine a giant furnace. That furnace is actually us, right? You're taking out the whole middle chunk. I also think you can highlight the unexpected nature of the furnace metaphor, right? You're taking the familiar once again and turning that familiar. Imagine a furnace. Everyone can picture that. But the crazy thing is that like, our bodies are a furnace. We kind of did that with the farts episode. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the whole at the end, as winter starts to come and we throw more bits of carbohydrates and stored energy. I mean, carbohydrates and stored energy are similar enough things that you can distill it down into one phrase. Um, sugars. Sugars, yeah. But by tightening all this intro stuff up into like maybe two concepts, it leaves you the rest of the episode to explore the cooler questions. And then you can go with, you know, you can, the metaphor you can take as far as you want. You can, um, 
you can say, okay, well, uh, are some people's furnaces more efficient? Do some burn different types of sugar? Whatever, whatever the answer ends up being, I don't actually know what the answer is. Um, I really want to know. But um, whatever that is, you can, you can develop the metaphor or not, uh, depending on whether it fits, uh, and, and really explore this, this fundamental, this question that's fundamental to the nature of our survival, because there will be another ice age. It's coming. We just don't know when. So we took this really, you know, this experience that we've all had, and we turned it into an existential crisis, which is great. So thank you. OK, uh, next. Uh, I was going to do two examples from, from each script, but I think we should just move on because we're running l short on time. Uh, OK, whose script is this? All right, come on up. All right, so you know the drill. Give us a read. All right, so um, once upon a time, in the year 2009, actually, Stephen Hawking held a party with all the usual stuff, wines, hors d'oeuvres, and yet no one turned up. And you thought he'd be upset, but in fact, he was actually quite happy because he had just proven his own belief that it was impossible to travel back in time. He had, in fact, sent out the invitations for the party to, uh, to time travelers after the party. I didn't mention that. A lack of party goers actually meant that time travel was probably impossible, or just that people thought that Stephen Hawking was lame and didn't really want to go to his party. <laughs> so was time travel really possible then? Not possible? Yeah. Great. All right, coming back. Um, OK, so what is effective in this script? Introduction, really. It's not a full script. Yeah. You don't have to raise your hand. Just. Yell it out. Yeah. Um, well, he introduces a cool character who we know, but here he's doing this party thing that's just like us. Right. So we all, we all love Stephen Hawking. Uh, if you don't, leave immediately. <laughs> um, no. Uh, so right, right off the bat, uh, Stephen Hawking is invoked, and um, that's great. Now we know exactly who we're talking about. We're all on the same page, uh, and we all love Stephen Hawking. At least, let me. Your audience for this video is most likely going to know and love Stephen Hawking. Not everyone does. And even if they don't, it's still a cool enough premise. It's, this one's doing the opposite thing, taking something unfamiliar, and you're going to spend the adventure familiarizing your audience with it. That someone had a party in t uh, intending to have no one show up because he was proving that time travel was impossible. It's like this pop culture fascination. It's like very Hollywood science. Um, it's what it's the reason why so many of the specials that do happen on TV and so much of the science that does end up getting broadcast on that, on major networks. They're all about, you know, astrophysics stuff. And it's because it's commercializable. It's just cool. It's just I mean we have in who here has watched Cosmos? New or old? New. Both. Um, so there is, I mean, at one point in one of the episodes, either Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson, or probably both, say that, you know, that we have this inbuilt fascination looking up at the stars and wondering what our place is in the universe. Um, and that is absolutely true. And, and, and um, shows and movies capitalize on that all the time. Interstellar, Gravity, I mean, uh, are two of the most recent ones. But we've always, we've always looked up and wondered and written stories about it. Um, OK, what else works? So what's, what's instantly different about this script, this introduction, versus the last introduction? Something visual. It's associating a famous character with something, something very visual. In my mind, I'm thinking of this like, sad face and smiley face. It's going to be quite funny. Okay, take that, take that even further. It's visual, but it's also. What, what are, so when, when Kenneth, Kenneth got up here and started talking to you, what was he doing? He was also showing me a set face. He was, he was what, sorry? He was, he was. Yeah, he was expressive, right? right? He but, was this set tone and happy tone. But even before that, once upon a time, what's that? Once upon a time. It's a story. Right? You're telling a story. And uh, 
it, you know, eventually in this, in this intro, I mean, this is also a story that you're telling, but once upon a time is right off the bat, everybody knows that's story time. Um, and just like we're hardwired to sort of look up at the stars and wonder where we came from, we're hardwired to love stories. When you start a sentence with once upon a time, you're listening. That doesn't necessarily mean... You should. You should. Yeah. <laughs> but again, like take everything we say with a grain of salt. It's not the tools that you use that make things work. It's the reason why you use the tools. So you don't have to say once upon a time here to know that it's a story, right? Because you say, even if you didn't say it, you'd say, in 2009, Stephen Hawking held a party. No one showed up, but he was thrilled. Why? Because he just proved time travel. Let me explain to you how that works, blah, 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 right? I didn't, I didn't say once upon a time, but even though I didn't say it, the, my first two sentences are still this like, click, I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, what else is effective? Actually, effective or what you would improve? I think the last sentence kind of um, throws a loop in and I'm unsure about what the, the body of it's gonna be because you take this really smart guy like Stephen Hawking, you just prove that can't travel back in time. So is this going to explain why that's true? Or is this the next breakthrough in astrophysics where it actually is true? Like I'm kind of unsure you know, what, what's going to happen there. Anybody else a little bit? Are you saying that as, a, as something that works Maybe or something, something that could be improved to, or what? To clarify, I guess. OK. Yeah. Was anybody else a little bit hazy on where the script is going or what's been said already? Yeah? Um, so when I read this, I was a little bit confused. So explain, like, what's the answer to his question? Tell me in a couple sentences. Yeah, like, what, summarize your script for me in, like, two, three sentences. After that, we talk about what time travel, as in how is it maybe possible time travel, and why so far we haven't been able, or why theoretically it's not possible to do it. Yeah, so, but at the end of it all, we ended up like, Maybe we just haven't explored enough yet. We, are not, we don't understand enough of the world yet to have time travel. So the conclusion, the bottom line, main point of the video is we're not sure if time travel is possible. But currently it points to the fact that we are unable to. But, but most science says that it's, it's not going to be possible? Yeah. So we think it's not going to be possible, most ever. So. But yet we're still asking. Yeah. We're, we're questioning it. I think to fix that, instead of maybe prove that, I don't know, you could just take a less qualifying word, like the possibility that you just proved it, or something that gives in like, some sort of air that there is a possibility that it isn't true, or, you know. So, yeah, let me ask you, how does the, um, without, without going back to this intro, tell me again the, the, the underlying theory behind the party and what it proves that no one showed up or doesn't prove, or we think, or whatever? Um, prior to this, Hawking has a, his own empirical data. I'm not sure about exactly. Yeah. But um, he believes that um, it's not possible. So he set up this extra experiment. He believes that time travel is not possible. not possible. Okay. So he set up this extra experiment. He hosted the party. He, in fact, was on YouTube, if I remember right. Um, then he, was, he sent out the invitations after the party to time travelers. So he even included like specific coordinates, a specific date and time. So when no one showed up, then he was like, oh, so it's not. I see. OK. All right, now I get it. So uh, when you read the script the first time, did, wh whose understanding of the script changed based on hearing that explanation? I must say that I, I actually know this point. But reading this, I didn't understand until I recollected what it did. And it actually happens to be a Big Bang Theory joke. Oh yeah. yeah, a Big Bang Theory joke where they were like, they sat together and they said, let's let's swear to this day that we will come back to this exact same moment if we do invent a time machine. And then they wrote this letter and swore on it, and they waited for one second, and no one came, and they were really sad. Uh, okay, so it's it's a that's another version of the same of the same. Okay, all right, yeah. So um, so now now I totally get this. Um, let's think about other creative ways to. I don't. You don't. I still don't get it. I'm really sorry, but I still don't get it. I, I, I don't understand the concept that he sent invitations after a party and no one showed up. Okay, so someone else explain it in a different way than, than has already been explained. Okay, so it's like, 
if, if I were to swear to myself right now that uh, in the future, if I do invent a time machine, and if I do, I will come back to the time when I'm writing this right now. So, I, theoretically this meeting, that, that will mean that as I'm writing this, my future, my future self will come right now. Okay. Yeah. But actually, now that you say that, that brings up a really interesting point. Your version just proves that you're not going to invent a yes. time machine. But Kenneth's version proves that all no the, one... All the time travel is possible that he sent to would not be able to... Right. Sorry, that, so, ev sorry. So Kenneth's version proves that everyone that Stephen Hawking sends an invite to will not invent a time machine. Doesn't necessarily prove that no one will ever invent a time machine. Right? Um, it's just an interesting point, yeah. There was also a time traveler's convention in the 90s on East Campus. So this happened? At MIT. Okay. Um, so that's just another thing you could kind of mention. You know, other people have tried to do it, um, and that supports the claim. But also, it's nicer to say that MIT students are lame than Stephen Hawking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's a good example, but we're still missing what the big, like we're coming up with examples um, and sort of accessories when we don't have the core point of of the video. And I, I really feel like taking the last question, completely scrapping it, and trying to figure out how to best set up the rest of the episode is what's going to help you the most. When, when you explained all that stuff to me, um, I totally read your intro completely different. And the question that I came up with in my head before you asked your question, like, so you read through the whole thing, you said, or maybe Stephen Hawking was too lame. My initial question as an audience member was, okay, well then, how did he prove that? Like, how did that party prove it? And if it did prove it, why are we still asking ourselves if time travel is possible? Um, I, I guess that's like how I, I initially reacted. And that sets up a very, very different episode than the question that's up there right now. Yeah. I, I also want to give, so um, this kind of discussion is exactly the kind of discussion that happens with every script that we do for Science Out Loud. Um, and I want to, I know it seems like we're piling on, but I really want to give you props for doing, like taking a chance and doing this sort of creative intro. Because where we're going with this I think is really interesting. So um, your two questions at the end are, what were they again? It was? It was, well then, I, how did this actually prove it? Right. And if it's proven, why are we still asking ourselves? Yeah, so if we could have an infinite party where we send out infinity invitations to everybody on the planet in the future, would that prove, and then no one shows up at this party, would that prove that, um, that time travel is impossible? So, so let, me, let me back up. Then going from the Big Bang example, which is, or no, actually your example, which is you proving to yourself. Like, you say, all right, if I invent a time machine, then I'm going to come, I swear to myself I'm going to come back to this moment. I don't come back, so I didn't invent a time machine. Then to Kenneth's version, Stephen Hawking sends an inv invitation to like, let's say 20 people, right? No one shows up, means those 20 people didn't come back in time. Actually, um, it was more like an open invitation to the future. Like, it's, it, it's, it was like a well-documented, not maybe not well documented, so the, like a fact that he had a party, so in future people were to like, invite time travel. Anyone who is in that line will probably know of this party. So, yeah. But conceivably, right, you could, I mean, it, it's, I get what you're saying. It is, I think, as a thought experiment, like, you're going to miss somebody in your invite if you send out a finite number of invitations, no matter how, like, broad your spectrum is. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you could, you could pick something in between where you, you send out, I don't know, a million invites. But there are still seven billion people on the planet, right? So, so the only and then then the question is like, okay, if you send out if you send an invitation to not just everybody who's alive right now, but everybody who will ever be born from this moment forward, everybody, whatever number of billion or hundreds of billion of people that is, theoretically, if someone invents a time machine and decides to go to your party, they would come back in time and go to your party, right? So. Um, so then if you, you set that, up, that story up with the audience, and that's a long setup, right? You've got three separate scenarios, either between one and three. You could do two scenarios. But it's a long setup, but the story element of it means that your audience will probably stick with you, and especially because it's an unusual story. It's like a weird 
thing, and there's confusion at the beginning, right? You know, you're saying like, hold on, I didn't get it. Your audience is going to be in that space for the first 30 seconds of the video, and there's a fine line between I don't get it, I'm going to turn off this video, and I don't get it, I'm interested, I want to keep watching. Um, but if you can stay on the line of I'm interested, I'm going to keep watching, the I don't get it can be an okay thing to do. Uh, and then after that, you get into Elizabeth's question of, you know, what what is this exper what does this thought experiment actually mean, and does it does it prove anything, and how do we know? Which I think is a fascinating video. Yeah. Conceptually, it's, I think it's really hard the, the double negative to either choose to say that is time travel possible or not not the opposite, which is is time travel not pop? Like it's just harder to conceptualize. So when you do go down this road, I would just see if you can pick the the affirmative approach, which is is time travel really possible? Yeah. yeah. I would wait to ask that question though, because that's actually not the question that's relevant to this intro. The question is, how did that prove it? Then the next question is, doesn't, doesn't. why why are people still looking? And then the immediate question that follows as well, is time travel possible? Like that's, that's the core question, but it doesn't show up. Um, it, it's too big to spring it on the audience at the beginning. You kind of have to lead up to that question. This is great. This is a fascinating Good job. Uh, anything else before you move on? Yeah. Uh, question on, like, so there was that bit of discussion where there was a detail on how many people Stephen Hawking actually sent out invitations yeah, yeah. But that kind of uh, detail doesn't really affect the knowledge they're trying to disseminate. It's it okay if we were to, well, because it's not really an official history point. Yeah. So I I'm not sure whether are we allowed to deviate from No, that's a great, that's a great point. I mean, in writing your scripts, you will generate more material than you'll use and probably going through, you know, I had the three scenarios, probably the middle scenario is just not worth doing because it takes up a lot of time, there are a lot of like subtleties to it, uh, how many invitations exactly, who gets the invitations, et cetera, et cetera, that is not important for the, for the subject matter of the video. So being able to edit yourself or edit others uh, on that stuff is really good. So yeah, absolutely, great point. You can also gloss over it pretty fast. You can be like, okay, so when you're explaining the actual details of the party, you say, he sent out an open invitation, no one came, so the conclusion was that no one invented a time machine. Well, I guess you could say, you know, maybe someone in Antarctica like wasn't aware of the open invitation, <laughs> so that's why they didn't come. So what if we could ensure that every single human being on Earth who will ever exist in the future somehow got this invitation? Then would the argument still hold up? You know, then you're glossing over each incremental example um, and sort of addressing the crux of of the loophole that's in that scenario. Yeah. Um, also, I wanted to mention humor. Um, so, kind of saying that Hawking was too lame. Um, while the other humorous parts are very effective, that one may be kind of edgy, especially people who don't know who Hawking is. Mm -hmm. Maybe like, oh, this person is lame, and people who right. do know him know that. Yeah, um, I actually, so that reminds me of the, your earlier point, which is that this actually happened at MIT, that EC had a time traveler. And one of the things that we try and do with the Science Out Loud videos is establish a relevant MIT connection. Um, and so that would be a great way to do that. And then you get around the whole Stephen Hawking thing. Um, I like the humor point, though. I, I do, too, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, the word lame, like, Maybe he's like not yeah, as PC. I completely forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the whole concept of like, well, what other possibility? But like, maybe Stephen Hawking's rival just didn't want to show up to spite him. You know, like yeah. maybe like, yeah. like he's like, well, I've invented a time machine, but I'm not going to let you know about it because I'm too cool for you or whatever. Like, there are ways to to get that exact same humor thing without using lame. Yeah. But I, I, but I, I like, like the it. Point. I, I like it too. Keep it. Yeah, I like it too. Uh, all right. Anything else? Cool. Um, whose is this? All right, come on up. So as long as people have lived on this planet, there have been boats. Many of the model boats shown in this museum, this is at the, uh, like the ship museum at MIT. 
um, are over 100 years old, but evidence suggests that the oldest ones date back to log boats almost 10,000 years ago. But now when we look at onto the harbor, it is clear that we have advanced since the times of hollowed out trees. Today there are all types of ships such as container ships, oil tankers, and cruise ships, among others. Great, thanks. Okay, what works? Actually, uh, we're not gonna, just uh, comments in general. Good, bad, whatever. Yes? It feels a lot like a document. What do you mean by that? Uh, kind of like the, the image I get, like kind of walking through a museum, uh, and then like, look around us and kind of like, I don't know, it's, that's the feel I get. Okay. I think you're not wrong, it does feel like that. Oh, what's your question? Um, so, what three was, it kind of gets to that. Oh so, I, I think you're right, it does kind of, there's a lot of words before I get to the, what I'm presenting. What is the, tell us what, what it is. So, it's, it's about subdivisions, uh, subdivision in ships. So if you take something that floats, like a shoebox, yeah. and you put a hole in it, it'll sink. Right. But if you divide that shoebox into, you know, watertight sections, you know, this one compartment might not cause it to, to sink. And how we've advanced to, you know, the, the time where a ship can be extensively damaged and still stay, stay afloat and people won't die. Uh, what you just did right there is a fantastic pitch for a video like the way that you explained it to us right now. You get, in <laughs> you get into the subject matter quickly. You use, you use something that we're all familiar with, shoebox, right? Um, you start simple and you expand out. You, you, know, you start with a shoebox, expand out to a ship, and you have the potential for a, an example that is super relatable. Like that Italian cruise, was it an Italian cruise ship that like, well, it didn't sink, but it like yeah. turned sideways, right? You could use something like that. I'm sure there's a more appropriate example, right? Mm -hmm. But you just add that, and you have the perfect pitch and also a great introduction to a video, too. I also really like what he says in the second part, where he says he's a Coast Guard Marine Inspector and Naval Architect, a ship designer, and he loses sleep over this subject. So that, to me, sounds pretty cool, because first of all, those are awesome jobs, and also, you are saying that you have an emotional connection. You're an expert and you really enjoy this. Yeah, and the other thing is that, you know, we're, we don't, so Science Out Loud doesn't put random people on camera. Whoever we put on camera is going to have some connection to the material, whether it's, you know, this is my lab that we're working in or, you know, I, I am a, a member of the Coast Guard or whatever it is. Uh, and that, highlighting that is, highlighting that in a way that is not newscastery, right? Because it's hard, that's hard to do, but highlighting that, um, it can be really, can be, can draw the audience into the material. A lot better than Coach Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go for that now. <laughs> <laughs> so, honestly, I would, if I were you, I would cut the intro and go with what you just said. The other, th the other nice thing about the, what you said is that you can do it with a shoebox in front. Like you can, right. it's a demo you can do. Right. Um, so it has a visual that goes along with it really easily. And since you're actually doing that, I mean, there's potential for a really big visual reveal where mm -hmm. we have you framed with a shoebox and then cut you to a wide shot and reveal you in front of an actual ship. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot, a lot of potential to play with the visuals there where you don't have to say, all the boats here, right? Like, sure. we don't even have to go in the museum. We can actually go to your, wherever you work. Okay. Um, but I agree with, with George that I, when you were talking about the shoebox stuff, um, I didn't even realize that that was a question that I had. But then you made me think, just like how David made me think about the whole, like, why do some people feel colder than others? Like, how does it, a giant ship not sink if there's a little hole in it, whereas like, on a toy boat, if there's a hole in it, then it's just catastrophe. Yeah. Right? Another question I have about ships is that <clears throat> you see like a giant cruise liner, and like A, what percentage of it is underwater? Is it 10% or is it 50%? And B, how the hell does that thing not just tip over? Yeah. You I know? Asked that yesterday. Okay. So, are you wondering? Yeah. Okay. Well, they have, uh, 
there is a lot of draft on that, so the, the, the distance below the water line is substantial, so it's not uncommon to be 40 to 60 feet under the water. Okay. But they have fin stabilizers, which they use when a lot of people are on board, they're just pretty much wings that go on the side of the ship. And with that, they're able to adjust their attitude to provide more of a comfortable ride. Are they like wings like as big as an airplane wing, or is it shorter? Um, they're a little bit shorter and they're, they're like, kind of stubbier, but they're, they are pretty big. So if you took a cruise ship out of the water, it would look like a deformed penguin, kind of? Uh, I guess you could think. <laughs> okay. Most, most have them. Newer ones all have them. So. Yeah. Okay. That may be, this is, this is again that like idea explosion phase, you know, where you, you're, you're talking about, bo you know, you're talking about comp compartmentalization and that's the core of the video, mm -hmm. but there may be other things that, I don't know if this would, would actually make it into your video or not, but that is something that you wonder when you look at a cruise ship, like what, like how does that thing possibly stay afloat? Right. Is most of the mass underwater? Or not? Um, I, I can't really say like quantitatively, I, I'm not sure, yeah. but um, I know that that's one of the big parts of it is having uh, appendages that are able to reduce the roll. So if you have, you know, if you have a cylinder and it's in water and you're trying to pitch it or just like have it roll, it's going to go forever, but yeah. you put these two wings on it, you know, the, the inertia of actually rolling it is a lot harder because it has, you know, these arms to I think you've actually got material for two separate videos in there. I mean, I think the compartmentalization is one really, it could be a short video. I mean, it doesn't have to be long, right? Um, and then there's this whole other, I mean, you know, boats and shipbuilding and how, how do these things, how do these giant, because they've gotten big enough now that you can have two, 3,000 people on a, on a ship. Um, how do these things stay afloat? It'd be really cool, I think. From an educational context point of view, with the K-12 videos program in its old iteration where people made their own episodes, there were like 10 episodes on buoyancy. I don't know why people are so obsessed with explaining it, but I think it's because it's a topic that maybe people struggled with in school. I, I no, know it's a framework question. So, so, so second graders, it's like the essential question that is asked in their curriculum. Buoyancy. buoyancy. Yes, sink or float. What sinks, what floats, and why? And it's 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 a question that's intended to get them thinking scientifically. And so that big buoyancy question is like when I was learning to be a teacher, that was like the core question in even schools that had no science curriculum whatsoever. That's like at that age, that's when they begin in asking scientific questions. And that experiment is something you can do no matter where you are. You have a small bucket. And you any kid can do it regardless of what class. I mean, I taught in some inner city schools where there were no resources, but you can still do that experiment, you know? But do they figure out at that age, like, do they teach, like, why, like, a sinkable object like steel can float? Well, the idea is that students can construct truth themselves by experimenting, mm -hmm. right? So the teacher, if it's a great teacher, will put a bucket of water and a whole bunch of objects and encourage students to eventually come up with some truths themselves about what sinks and what floats through hands-on experimentation. And that's sort of the crux of the, the most early science exploration in our curriculum, which is why there's so much on sink and float. And that's why I was like, the kids were all, they all were interested in that when right. you talked to them, because they, they, it was drilled into them, at least in our educational system, the idea of sinking and floating is this like very, very, or like very, um, elementary concept that is the beginning of their scientific roots. But the reason why I bring it up is that there are a hundred videos on sinking and floating and they're all the exact same thing. Um, and every lesson on buoyancy, because I mean you learn you learn it in more detail in high school, mm -hmm. it's still on the same thing. Um, and this is presenting it in a way that's very, very different. And I, I hesitated to bring it up at all because I don't want you to look at those videos and I don't want you to look at the standards and like accidentally yeah. default to that style. I think you should totally keep going the way okay. you're going. Um, I only wanted to bring it up because I think that there's definitely an appetite for it in an educational context. I also wanted to bring up that, um, it's funny, I wish like we could have the raw footage from all the classes just to post day of because when you explain the technical components of the wings and stuff, mm -hmm. like we could have used that footage. And it's very different from when you read this aloud. And the script also like doesn't sound like you at all when you talk. 
Um, and it's a very difficult thing to do. I like I sympathize with you guys completely. It's really hard to become self-aware of your natural talking style. And so some of it will be just um, like maybe you want to record a conversation that you have with someone else. That might not be the best thing for everyone. Um, the, one of the things you could do is instead of recording yourself on camera, record just audio. Because mm -hmm. the visual part of it, like if you're conscious that there's a lens looking at you, it's very hard to be natural. Yeah, and I'm not very good in front of Well, that, I mean, getting rid of that misconception is a whole other thing yeah. we'll get into in a second. But it's much easier to just be yourself if, like, if you just have a mic and you're not really, you sort of forget that the mic's there, you're not looking into a lens or whatever. So, so um, having that, so, so it's easier to record yourself and see, hear what you really sound like if you just use audio versus you know, video as well. No. So say you have, you're trying to um, simplify something, a complicated concept. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about wings. And there's a lot of different technical reasons that like, you have these fin stabilizers. There. So just being able to say that this is stopping like the ship from rolling, from rolling it, it's true, but there's there's other aspects to it. Yeah. So this gets into the, the accuracy portion. Sure. Like you could have a naval architect go on K through twelve and be like, yeah, but there's there's more to it than that. Sure. So at what point do you like are you oversimplifying? I think <clears throat> um you can there's no harm in alluding to the fact that there are, that that you are just at the tip of the iceberg of information. So you could say something like, you know, the way you said it was, if you take a cylinder, put it in water and spin it, it'll spin. You take a cylinder, attach some wings, put it in water, it's much harder to spin it, right? That is all 100% accurate and true, but you don't get into any of the technical reasons as to why that's the case, right? That's one way to do it. The, oth the other way to do it is if you want to start talking about whys, and I don't know what the whys are, so you have to help me, but um, you can start off your sentences with, Look, this is a really simple way of explaining it, but basically, blah, 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 right? So you, you just sort of allude to the fact that, like, I'm giving you the super simple version of it. It's much more complicated than this in real life. Uh, and you can even explain what those complications are. So, you know, like, if you had wings with a bunch of holes in them, you know, they wouldn't be as effective as, as wings, you know, solid wings because X, Y, or Z. Or um, you know, if your if your ship's wings need to be able to do this and that for whatever reason, it, I mean, you can you can allude to stuff without actually explaining it, and that's okay because you do that in real life. If you're if you're sitting across the table from someone and explaining something to them, you don't the first time you do it, you're not going to be like, you know, uh, Roman numeral one, part A, subsection B. You know, you're not going to like go super in depth. You're just being like, look, here's the important thing to get right now. Here are some of the details. We can talk about the details later, but this is the this is the crucial thing. So more of like the result and not everything that got to that result. Um, I don't know that or I would. If it's a little too tricky, then kind of mention it, but you know, focus on what the the, the main reason why. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think just being conscious of the fact that what you're presenting isn't all of the information. Mm -hmm. It is an accurate portion of the information. Yeah what we want with science out loud um, and keep in mind it's a very different style than some of the other videos that I was talking about in the first day of class but we want to pique curiosity right like we want people to finish watching the video and ask themselves those questions and try to figure it out on their own and explore the other resources and that's a very different objective than say a lecture video um, or a technical video so just keep that in mind again like whatever best practices we're establishing here aren't necessarily the ones that you'll carry over to every single educational video. Educational video encompasses such a huge variety, right? Yeah. Um, but I think that's true of even the most technical video. And again, this goes back to the whole rabbit hole litmus test. Like, Once you find yourself clarifying more and more to the point where you found yourself on a topic that is tangential to the main point of your video or the main point of your lesson, um, then it's time to backtrack a little bit. And that's okay. Um, no video under an hour, no semester long class is going to answer every single question that's related to the topic of the class, right? But this gets back to like what we were talking about the broccoli, that like by, by going deeply, 
and, and narrowing your focus it actually mm -hmm. allows you to allude to a lot of much larger topics right, superficially. Right. And if people get it more concretely, the more narrow you are in your examples. And, and that's, I think, if there were a truth in here, that's the truth to sort of apply, mm -hmm. is that the more specific and narrow you can be without giving people that extra information, the easier it is to allude to that extra information without it, like a story flow, you want it to always move forward. Mm -hmm. And if this information is so little that it doesn't it doesn't prevent the forward motion of your storyline, then you know you're, you're doing a good job of including that. What you don't want is for this information to take you backwards or sideways. I mean, I guess I should rephrase that it's not necessarily a rabbit hole. You don't want to branch out too much, sure. right? You want accuracy, um, specificity to a certain degree. Like, you could very well do a video on why do boats float, mm -hmm. right? But that wouldn't really be a good video. It wouldn't be a very compelling video. If you're going to make a video about, like, the wings on a boat, you're going to hit the bigger topic of mm -hmm. how things float. But that's not the thing that's driving your video right. forward. And that's why your topic is perfectly narrow, of being like, you know, imagining three smushed, um, three differently smushed uh, shoe boxes. Yeah. Why does this one versus this one? And, and it's a narrow enough topic and concrete enough that it will allow you to get to some of those bigger sync, float, buoyancy, design issues, but using this very small way of getting access to that. By the way, I wanted to, um, I wanted to come back to something that is t tangential, ironically. Um, you said, you know, it's, maybe it's better than to just tell the results and leave out the process. And I said, no, maybe not. The reason that I said no is because sometimes you're going to, like, sometimes taking your audience through the experimentation that was done to get to a result is just as interesting or even more interesting as the result itself. So, like, in the Stephen Hawking example, you know, the, the time travel experiment and the intricacies of the time travel experiment are just as interesting, to me anyway, as the, the result of that experiment, right, whatever it is. So that's why I would just caution against using that. You know, sometimes, like, uh, how did you know? How did people first invent compartmentaliz compartmentalizing boats? Sometimes I'm not saying that is an in interesting answer. It may not be, but sometimes that process is just as interesting as the fact that there are compartmentalized boats and why they work. You know, what, one thing that I, I mentioned there, I don't know if it's worth kind of exploiting, is uh, I mean the whole reason why I thought it was like I know that floating is obviously a, a big uh, kind of teaching point, but if you open with like why did the Titanic sink, which has exactly to do with compartmentalization. Is that something that'd be a, a better hook? I, you know, I honestly like your shoebox better. I'll tell you why, because it's more visual. I mean, sorry, it, it's more visual because it has you in it, there's a demo, there's a thing that, that someone can look at, and it's directly accessible. With the Titanic, like, yeah, everyone, it's an example that everyone knows, and you could maybe use stock footage of the movie Titanic or whatever, right? But the, it's one degree of complexity. It starts at a higher level of complexity than your shoebox example. Well, I'm saying you could do... <clears throat> First shoebox, then Titanic? No, how the Titanic did their compartmentalization with the shoebox. You can, like, so they didn't finish their bulkheads to the deck, which you could actually easily build with the shoebox and then to see how progressive it was. So the problem with the Titanic was that their compartments did not extend all the way through the hull? All the way up to the to the weather video. Why? It seems dumb. I have no idea. Okay. But then the video becomes about why did the Titanic sink instead okay. of about how do I prevent boats from sinking okay. as a Coast Guard engineer? I think it's distracting. Okay. I think it's distracting. Right. And I think that, like, I don't know, the simplicity of this shoebox allows you to gain access to the concepts more okay. easily without getting the story of the Titanic. Right. The other thing is, if you were not at MIT studying naval architecture or whatever, and if you weren't actually an engineer, just like maybe Vsauce or Hank Green, then I'd say, yeah, talk about why the Titanic sunk. Right. But it's like a story that's already been told, okay. and it's a story that can be told by anyone. You have this opportunity to tell a story from a perspective that not very many people can. And that's what I was trying to get out on the first day about like being able to take yourself out of the perspective that you're used to having. Like I think that is an opportunity to capitalize upon for sure. 
So it's not that I think that the Titanic thing is a bad hook necessarily. It's just that the one you have is so much better uh, and one that not other people can do. Can I also say that you had mentioned about process? In my lab, the work that I see predominantly, I would actually argue that it's extremely hard for scientists to share process in an interesting way. <laughs> that scientists typically and I'm generalizing, and this is not really fair, but because you spend so much time day to day going through a process, you want to share it very chronologically, and that's your default, is to go through from start to finish telling people what you did, painstakingly detailed, and that's boring. And so it's really, really hard. If any of you end up doing a process where you're sharing a process, it's really hard to, fi to, to figure out the big picture within the process so that an outsider actually finds your process interesting as opposed to just sharing that I did this, then I did this, then I did this. Yeah, the, Explaining why I did what I did each way yeah. and what people care about. Well, the interesting part is, is uh, the moment of ingenuity that led to an experiment designed the way it was designed. Yes. Not the like day-to-day. -day. Exactly. Yeah. And I feel like because people in their labs are like, someone needs to listen to me, I did this. <laughs> it didn't work and I spent hours and hours working on this thing that didn't work. They feel like they want to share that with people, but that people don't actually usually care about that. They care about the why you designed the experiment that way and why it didn't work, as opposed to the what you actually did. The who cares kind of concept. Um, yeah. Actually, well, so I agree with you on the Titanic idea, mm -hmm. but, um, you mentioned that you could build um, these compartments out of shoeboxes, and I think that at least the, the kids that we talked to yesterday, they really like the idea of destruction, <laughs> something burning and being mm -hmm. crushed. So <laughs> if you could kind of talk about those concepts, and in the end, you could sink this, yeah. some random ship that would kind of show, oh, well, first of all, it's cool, but also it shows that what you're talking about is cool. Right. Yeah, don't get me wrong. You can totally bring up the Titanic at the end as like the bigger picture application. Sure. Yeah. That's awesome. It's just the hook isn't the place for it, I think, personally. Been done before. Yeah. I agree. Great. Anything else on this script? Going once, going twice. Before you go to the next one, I mean, I do just want to mention. <laughs> sorry. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Um, I do want to mention that you guys came up with like really fascinating topics. I mean, George and I were talking about it this morning. Um, so, I, I mean, we're, even though we're critiquing things, um, the, the topics at the core, I, I think are, there's a lot of potential for it. So, so just like an, a word of encouragement, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, I would, I would totally watch all of these videos. Just, I mean, I don't know where we're going quite yet, but we've been going for a while. I suspect people might need a bathroom. Oh, right? yeah, good idea. Yeah, I need a bathroom. Okay, so Great. maybe we should, before we dive into the next one, yeah, give good people idea. a chance to, like, stretch and do that. Yep. We've been going for a while. Okay, who wrote this? Come on up. I'm cold. I want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty warm, yeah. <laughs> I think it's where you're sitting partly. Like, oh, yeah. I was under a vent and it was freezing. Yeah. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay. Oh. Uh, few things strike more dread than hearing you have to get braces, right? Whether it's worrying about how much it will hurt, what happens if a wire pops out, how you're going to talk, or how much your friends will make fun of you, it's kind of an awkward experience. So why even get braces in the first place? Cut to pictures of famous stars who have had braces for the voice of it. Um, should I keep? Yeah, just okay. uh, Studies have shown that having a beautiful smile with even white teeth conveys health and youth and makes people like you even a little bit more. Cool, thanks. Who, uh, who are the famous stars that you were thinking of here? Um, that'll be tricky because it has to be that they're used to seeing, but I know Tom Cruise was one who actually had them as an adult. Um, but you had braces. Why not talk about you? Don't you have a picture of you with braces? <laughs> <laughs> but this video is about you. Um, 
the way that well the way that I structured it is to have as little of me in it as possible, which is why I had so much of like that animation. There would only be like one or two shots. Just out of curiosity, why? Yeah. Did, why did you structure it that way? Um, I like the animation aspect. I also know I don't look good on camera. <laughs> <laughs> No one, so it's like, no one knows that they don't look good on camera. I will, like, I, I feel like this is the fear that every person comes into a Science Out Loud episode with. It's like, we want to animate this because, like, I, I don't want to explain it on camera. Or I can't, like, say this long of a paragraph without stumbling. Or... Yeah. Or we'll take their script away and they'll be like, I can't. Act like, I need to have it. I can't do it. Yeah. Right? That is so not true. Like, you can't actually prove that you can't do it. Um, and we want your faces to be on camera. Like I, and we can talk about this more, but I, I think that if you do too much of the pictures and the voiceovers and the animations, then we go back to that uh, Siri litmus test where like if we swap you out for anyone else to do this video, it's not gonna make a big difference. And I don't know if you're okay with that, but I certainly feel like you have compelling enough of a perspective. Didn't you say you used to work for it? an orthodontics company. Yeah, like that is an, a really unique perspective, both from the industry, um, and I, my mom's a dentist, so I used to work at her office and I had braces twice, and like I, I know for sure that like there's so much fascinating information about that that you would know from that perspective that most people don't. Um, like you can make a video that a lot of people can't, and I, I would hesitate to let you go on thinking that that your video should be the way that you you're planning to have it be right now. And that's not to say that like it's just going to be you on camera or in any of you, right? It's not to say like the entire video is going to be from here to here 100% of the time talking, right? We I mean, we know that that doesn't make for compelling video, right? You want to have the person doing something, interacting with their environment, being in an interesting place, uh, whatever. There are lots of ways to complement the fact that, I mean, that, because, I mean, let me back up a second. The, the human to human, I mean, ideally you want to transmit information, one person sits down and talks to another. That's like the idealized way to, to engage someone, convey information, talk about an interesting subject, whatever it is. Um, you know, obviously video gives you the power to do that to a wide audience at once, and it's remote, but there is something about seeing someone's face and, and expressions and intonations and something that, that really draws you into the material. Um, but that having been said, you don't want to just stay on that person's face for the whole video and not show anything else, right? Um, so, uh, but that's our job um, as you know, producers and directors is to f is to figure out where it makes sense to just do a simple headshot of someone talking versus where it makes sense to cut away for an animation. If you're talking about like teeth moving, that might be a perfect place to do it. Um, versus where to do a demo or or whatever it is to keep visual variety and interest throughout the video. But um, yes. That was a tangent, an important one. But well, I think it's actually really important. It's, well, it's also a segue into the poster. Yeah, because I mean, like, like you know, I have all these these graduate fellows who work for me. We give workshops all over campus, and our and our our biggest credibility in sort of why we can give our workshops and why people care and listen to them is because we give workshops on how to succeed at the National Science Foundation Awards from people who have actually earned them. Right? We're authentic. I did this, I'm gonna tell you what I did to be successful. That's what you have that's so powerful. I'm a student, I'm studying this at this really great institute, and I'm gonna share with you how I think about something. I mean, that's like the most authentic you can be, is being you, you know? Not, it would be a shame to, to go to someone who's inauthentic, like someone we don't know, like a, a movie star, when you have this, this like incredible credibility by just being you. So powerful. Okay. Um, Sorry, it's just you guys are so cool. No, no, I'm that you. you're no, you're absolutely right. That's that is correct. Uh, I. But now it's about how to structure the script in which you can feel most comfortable being that. Yeah. 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 Um, there was something I wanted to say about this, but I forgot. Maybe it'll come back to me. Anyway, uh, comments on the script before we get into the hosting side. I think the, the, the script on the station 
What do you like about it? I, I thought that when she was saying it, as if I imagine her like saying this to a bunch of girls in the front of the fireplace. <laughs> 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 like, like telling them a story about her life and saying like, oh, I used to have braces and I didn't like it. So why do you want to get braces? And after that, she will go on to the next part as to why it's important and whatnot. Yeah, so she gives um, very specific examples about realistic fears that people will have about braces, and that makes it relatable. It's going to hurt. Uh, you know, you've got these like metal wires in your mouth. What happens if they poke you in the gum? Uh, how are you going to talk with all this stuff in your face? Uh, people are going to make fun of you. Um, you know, those are actual real fears that you get when you had braces. So, you know, um, pointing them out like that is, is effective. What else? Check is the content. Is the question on the video why we get braces or is it? The actual video itself is about how, how what happens when the braces move your teeth on a cellular level. What happens when it's like this? Um, as, as the force is applied to your tooth, um, there are two different types of cells, uh, one of which actually dissolves some of the bone in your jaw to make a little bit more room and another one that actually builds the bone to be able to hold the tube in place. Wow, I had no idea, that's cool. Um, and that, I think, like that's like the, the shoebox thing. That's right? the reaction you want from an audience. Yeah. That, what I just did, which I wasn't faking it, that's an authentic reaction, that's the reaction that you want. Yeah, I mean, later on in the script I say, yeah, yeah. it's actually dissolving your jaw. Yeah, um, I had a question, how, so the braces are attached, they're not attached, they're only attached to your teeth, right? right? So normally when you want to move something, like I want to move this table, my foot's attached, or not attached, but my foot's on the floor and I push against my foot to like pull the table, right? Whereas with braces, I'm not holding some external object to like pull teeth in a certain direction. So how is it that by... Headgear. Huh? Headgear. Headgear, yeah, but most people don't. Okay. Yeah, I think most... I, I, I don't know, I've, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think people, when you get braces, usually it's just the metal and the wire in the tooth. Um, but there's no external support there, so how, how, does it, how does it move your teeth? So that's a, that's a physics question, and we went over this yesterday, because there are sort of very different, there are different aspects. There's the sort of what's happening on the cellular level, yeah. which is one approach. You can also do it from the um, material science Basically, what moves your teeth is the wire itself and its weird shape that's constantly applying pressure. Is that why you get your wire changed? Yes. Okay. I mean, imagine exactly why you get being one person who has two boxes on either side of them and they want to bring them closer together. Right? There's the external forces that the person itself pulling them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, the, but the tension in the wire is that's the. Right. Yeah, okay. But don't like, when I have braces, they have like my molars. I don't know if they're using it as mounting points or not, but yeah. they have, you have the metal kind of like... Mm -hmm. Like yeah, anchors. Just put a whole band mm -hmm. around your... But they don't do like that anymore. Oh, they don't? They don't. They don't. Back in my day. They I know. They, <laughs> they have much better adhesives now. So that yeah. was another, yeah. like, the chemistry of the epoxy that actually... I mean, there's a lot yeah, of science there is. that goes into it. And when you think sense. about it, like... Oh, I would have this discussion with my mother all the time because I had to have braces twice. And I was like, Mom braces when you think about it they're like barbaric I can't believe we're living in the 21st century and I go to a I pay money for a person to glue metal to my mouth and take wires to yank my teeth together because I have too much gap in between like that's so barbaric when you think about it that your jaw is dissolving but like barbaric in a way that's like fascinating to watch on video right and I feel like that's such a more high stakes drama-driven hook, then you're worrying if braces will hurt or how you'll look. It's interesting, too, because the bottom question gets at the, like, what sort of the anthropological question of what is beauty. Yeah. yeah. But but really, I think it's much more, I mean, if we're going to get back to, like, the evolutionary question of what, what makes someone cold versus hot and will they die sooner or not, like, if all of us have evolved to the point where, what, like, 80% of your, of, like, tweens end up getting braces like what's wrong with our society and like why do we have to keep fixing these teeth is it actually going to make us die sooner if you don't fix your teeth yeah. or is it just because we look prettier yeah is it cosmetic 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, I know that I will at some point have to deal with some more significant dental issues that are actually about, like, my functioning. But, but like, what proportion of this is actually, I don't know. Like, and, and I don't know if that's a question that you're even going to get into, but, like, why do so many teenagers end up getting braces? Yeah. So, um, that, so that and, and Elizabeth's point are, are related. I, I when when she was describing the barbaric barbarity of like you get you, these metal blocks and a wire in your mouth and all sorts of what technique is that what is that like, it's not a metaphor right what what is she doing there pain. yeah okay so she's inducing emotional pain by asking you to put yourself in in her shoes and getting this but like specifically when she says like okay you get braces you're gonna go and have someone you're gonna pay them to glue metal stuff to every one of your teeth, then take a wire that is not in the shape of your mouth, bend it to the fits your, and then like it forces your teeth to move around. Like what is that that she's doing? Who here has seen Robin Williams' um, comedy sketch on golf? Anyone? Okay, um, you have? It has a lot of bad language in it, but it is hilarious, and I can't do it here for that reason, but you should watch it um, tonight. He basically says like, look, golf. You take a stick with a really tiny metal thing on the end of it, and you have a small ball. And the goal is, without touching the ball, to beat it with the stick until you get close enough to a tiny hole in the ground that you can take another stick and then gently tap the ball into the hole. Not once, but 18 times. Like what, that's the same technique as Elizabeth's using. What is that? What's, why is that interesting? Why, why does that make us listen? Yeah. Well, it's humorous because you describe like you get used to the jargon and different terms, but it's the sort of thing if you're trying to describe it to someone who has no clue what you're talking about, it just sounds so utterly ridiculous. Exactly. So it is the humor is actually I'd argue is a secondary component. The really the crux of it is what you said about being used to something. It is taking something that's familiar, and and describing it from a completely different vantage point. And you can do that with you can you can only do that with things that are familiar enough that people are so used to them that you know they just sort of they don't think about it braces oh yeah braces whatever, um, but when you shift that perspective you do inject humor you can inject drama um, you can inject mainly humor and drama yeah humor and drama um, and you force people to sort of step out of their comfort zone and consider something that they have never they they just look at it in a diff totally different way. Um, which is an alternative opening, right? So that's another thing that you could consider. Like, if I were to tell you, and the way to do it would be to do it as a reveal. If I were to tell you that you're gonna go to someone's place of business, pay them money to fill your mouth with a bunch of metal and plastic and chemicals, uh, would, you do, would, you know, would you do it? And then like, no, but people do this every day, it's called getting braces. I mean, that, I, the way I just did it was not very good, um, but you get the general idea. Uh, okay, other comments? Um, I also like yesterday, I was actually with Andrea when she was pitching her idea to um, sixth graders. Mm -hmm. And her first question was, you know, do you have braces? And this one girl who did, she was really excited about that. Like, yes, this is about me. And then the next question was, well, do you know what they do? And she started, you know, pitching all these ideas. You know, this is what I think they do. Um, but then the answer was very different. Uh -huh. um, but um, and they're very excited about the, it. Sorry, the girl's answer. The girl yeah. thought they did something completely different than they actually did. What did she think they did? Um, she just kind of said, you know, pushing teeth, whatever, uh -huh. just a really basic answer. Uh -huh. uh, but then Andrea was saying, you know, there's so much they actually do, um, and I thought that was um, a really cool way to get into it because they got really excited and they started talking about their experience with braces. So here it's kind of if you say maybe instead of whether it's worrying, you could say, you know, do you worry about how much it'll hurt and all these things and kind of get the audience thinking, maybe offering their own ideas, but also it connects them to, you know, this is something that I have. Yeah. So the, that approach is generally, I would call it the like preconceived notion approach. So you basically guess or know what your audience thinks about something uh, and usually that is either entirely wrong or parts of it are wrong or not complete or whatever. And you say, you know, you start the video by saying, 
you probably think that x, but actually y, you know, uh, or z or whatever. Um, and so that is another, it's, it's very different than the fill your mouth with a bunch of metal and wires and stuff, but it can be just as engaging and interesting, depending on what the subject matter is. Um, the, the only difference, and this is where you got to be careful, is that when you're actually in a room interacting with people, going back and forth with the Socratic method is great and it is a perfect way to get into the topic, but you can't do that with video. Um, and so you, what you don't want to do is take, is make that two-dimensional conversational, sorry, make that two-dimensional conversation one dimension by sort of just stripping the way, away the kids' answers and, and just putting in the questions, right? Um, that I think gets, it, it, it's, it's kind of like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole or the other way around um, in the sense that it's n designed for one medium and you're trying to use it in another. And I, I know that's not a great way of explaining why it doesn't fully work, and I don't necessarily have a better way of explaining. Yeah, but like, how, like Dora and why Blue's Clues are developed the way that they are, where it's like these rhetorical questions where they leave space for the kids to, I mean, like my son will actually answer the television. And yeah. that's like the, the educational best practices for educational video that I was talking about the first day that you acknowledge your audience, that you give them for interaction. I will say about um, going off of your comment um, and sort of like addressing the kids where they are, don't forget about George's point of talking for the audience. Not to them, yeah. Not to them. Um, because the only, um, I, I guess like the overall point I would say about the wording and the setup of this opening is that um, a sixth grade kid would be interested in this. But I'm not sure that their parent would necessarily relate, right? Um, and maybe it's just the way the questions are posed um, or the types of questions that are asked. Um, but there's a risk of falling into this tone of like after school special, right? Um, I don't know, George, do you have like <laughs> tangible yeah, feedback I mean, that you can give about that? I, I can't identify exactly what it is. Let's see. Maybe the question of, so why even get braces? Like, the way, how that follows this list of examples of like how much it'll hurt. And depending on the delivery, it can really change how this reads. But so why even get braces leads me to think that this is the type of video that they'll show at a dentist's office. Because I feel like maybe what you're getting back to is the, this is the first, the first, um, example that we've seen where she's directly talking to you mm -hmm. whereas the other ones it's more either uh the voice is different in all the other ones this is right. the first one where she's talking directly to the audience yeah and, and it's abstract like um you were using yourself to say you know this is what i do on a boat have you, you know like this is a boat and then this is back to me my voice and you were talking about, you know, time travel and Stephen Hawking as his third, third, you know, third voice. Um, but this is the first time we've seen a, sort of an abstract you in there mm -hmm. that makes it, I think, a little, a little fuzzy in that way. Yeah. And I'm not necessarily sure that it would ha help to just switch out the you with a we, you know, because it's, it is a we, but it's also sort of a royal feeling we, rather than a, you know, we're, yes, we're going to yes. do this. Um, royal, by the way, I, I don't want to, I realize I'm like lacing this with jargon, but royal we means basically just I. Like you say we, but you mean I. Um, so I don't know, I think this is a really interesting problem. Does anyone have thoughts on how to reword without, without going the sort of dramatic dentist route? Because I think this is, this is interesting, yeah. Well, uh, we mentioned like uh, the, the personal aspect of it. I mean, you had braces and you stuff and this and that kind of invites everyone. In. So, you know, we can say us because I experienced it just as you might be experiencing it right now. Uh -huh. I, I kind of think it'd be even better if, I know you don't have braces now, but I would almost want the host of the video to either actually have braces or, um, I don't know if it's even possible to like put fake braces in your mouth, like temporary braces that you could just have in there for a day. 
and to just start with something like. They did it on Ugly Betty for all their seasons. <laughs> did they really? Uh, I, don't I thought she actually had braces. I don't know. Anyway, um, but uh, but to start with something like, see the metal stuff in my teeth? This is called braces, and it, you you have this you have this like, you know, um, there the piece of metal is glued to my teeth. This wire is bent, and it's forcing my teeth around. So you're not you're kind of doing the sort of dramatic dentist approach, but not not as storified, um, and you are um, inadver you're, you're sort of sideways hitting these points like you know I've got all this stuff in my mouth it's gonna is it gonna hurt um, you know what happens if this wire pops out like clearly I have a bit of trouble talking or whatever whatever the issues are um, but you but you do it in a way that is because you're pointing at something because it's kind of a demo it's more conversational more relatable relatable I don't know that's my thought on it what do you guys think I was thinking maybe yeah. you know like <laughs> so maybe like start off with like have you ever had braces or heard from a friend with braces like how much it hurts when the stuff comes out. Mm -hmm. So it relates back to that. With braces your second time having them or your first it was your first time? You could show crazy teeth. <laughs> David Bowie's teeth. Right, yeah, any English person. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, you could, uh, you know, I think maybe we've all seen the bubba teeth enough times that we know what they are when we see them, but maybe many eighth, year, eighth graders haven't seen them, and you could like start talking with this horrible mouth of teeth and then pull them out. In what way? I like that idea. Well, I feel like this is backing out a lot um, from what we're talking about, but my big question is why we even have the first section, because to my understanding, the video is about how braces work. But in this first section, it's more about why would you get them. But I kind of get the feeling that the video isn't really about why you get them, it's just how they do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Going off of that, I was trying to freeze, uh, like figure out what my main concerns with this were. And I, I didn't like have a mental grasp on it until you mentioned tonalism. Because like I haven't had braces. I don't plan on getting braces. And I don't. So I felt really alienated by the you in this because I would probably realistically turn this video off because I'm not interested in why people get braces because that's not relevant to my life. But if you pose the question, have you ever thought about exactly what braces do? Um, that's a much more interesting question to me and to probably a broader audience and would fix your tone with whatever intro you decide to on because that seems to be what your video is going to be about. And especially if you phrase it like braces are much more scientific than we think they are. They're not just like magically pushing your teeth into the correct place. There's actually a lot of things going on in your mouth that people don't think about. And like thousands of people have braces every day. I mean the other thing is like I don't actually think that the point of your video should be how braces work, right? Because that's an instructional video that like Invisalign could make, you know, and has made so many times. I've seen them so many times. <laughs> um, like, the, there's no spark or wonder or curiosity in that whatsoever. And I'm not saying that every video has to be Neil deGrasse Tyson contemplating on the philosophies of our existence or whatever. <laughs> but like, when you think about it, we can have, like, you can be born with bubba teeth, right? And we have the ability to know how to craft bones in our body, like your teeth are the only exposed bone in your entire body. And we have figured out a way to alter that um, in such a way that we can still continue to use them. So it's not like you break a bone and try to uh, like align a, a crooked finger or something. You're, we've adapted in such a way, like we've loopholed around Bubba teeth and the bones that we have been born with and can actually dissolve the osteoblast or osteoclast or like get them to dissolve bone and restructure it and we can manipulate essentially um, I don't know like I think what you're saying is braces things. shouldn't work like just by by reasonable or not even that they shouldn't work but like we shouldn't be able to do the things that we can do with braces right yeah like they they like yeah. braces shouldn't exist no well I, I don't know that they shouldn't exist they just shouldn't they just shouldn't like the fact that you can 
basically blunt trauma move teeth around and then yeah. your body gets them to stay where you put them is really weird, right? That, that's something that is, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know about if you were to break an arm and, and like what the difference is between like braces and a cast, for example, that might be another analogy or you know, like simile or whatever, but I don't, I mean, it is bizarre. You know, when you said the thing about it, it one type of cell dissolves the bone and then the other one like put, I guess, re-bonifies it uh, way in the right place. Um, to me, that's the weirdest and coolest part of the braces thing. And so, you know, incidentally, why, like, why does your body even do that? I mean, it's not something that your body came up with in response to braces. This is an ability that it has, right? Yeah, this is in your entire So what, like, what, hap what happens in our natural experience where our mouth would need to do that? You get a tooth knocked out, or, or what? Um, like, why can we do that? Is it only teeth, or is it, is it only gums, or is it elsewhere in our body, too? Body. It's in your entire body, because you, have, you, you very rarely have two hard substances butting up against each other. They have usually some covering that's mediating that relationship. Yeah. And then if something happens to like permanently mean that okay, this these two pieces of hard substance now have to be in this orientation as opposed to this one, how do you get it to stay that way? So this is more about how the body heals itself than it is about braces. It's almost yeah, I, 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 the, the, the word isn't even heal, it's more like how your body deals with something it can't change anymore. Because healing implies that like it puts it back the way it was, which is not what it's doing, right? It's like we are we are brute changing our bodies, and it's adapting to what we're doing. Did you want to raise your hand? I think there's some uh, experimental thing on how like basically basically to make yourself taller. What they do is they break the bones in your in your legs. Then they then oh, they your ball no, 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 no. To make yourself taller. Yeah. yeah. Oh. yeah. So like maybe for a period of one year, they keep breaking a bone in your leg. Then they stretch it slightly, like a few, I don't know, inches or millimeters or something. How many inches can they eat out of you that way? Yeah, so at least one, like an inch. Or one, is it really worth one inch? That's really painful. Cool. Yeah. So, so they keep breaking, and then they have the metal bar. So you always have to keep it the distance apart. But and the so thing, the sorry, the, the point of the video, though, this is what, going back to Jamie's point of like, you hone in on something very specific like braces. But the point of the video is not really just, this is what happens when you get braces. It points to this bigger thing that we're actually manipulating natural processes that happen in our bodies that are important. Like, your bones have to break down and remodel all the time. Like, that is actually an essential process of like, osteoclasts, you know, dissolving old bone and osteoblasts forming new bone. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't happen, like, your body like can't exist that's like actually an essential process and with braces you're manipulating that uh, you're like tricking your body in a way to adapt to these like blunt forces that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do we had no idea when we invented braces that that's what was happening right this was discovered afterwards or or did yeah. we know yeah yeah and i think kind of like taking those to what you were saying earlier about like how can we do this and what you were just saying like um like we're, we're manipulating a natural thing um I think part of what you can do is like I was talking to you about how you know how your teeth slip. If your teeth want to go back to its natural state, they don't want to be straight. They want to be whatever you're born with. Um, and how that I, I don't know if it's possible. You might be able to say that angle like you know we're made as how we're made and we're trying to manipulate this, but in the end we just want to go back to originally how we were. And how this this uh, process of using braces is kind of uh, at first it can seem like it's barbaric, but it's trying to I don't know. This is such an interesting challenge because we were talking about this yesterday, how Andrea is, is struggling with the opposite issue that all, almost all of the rest of your, yeah. your scripts are struggling with, which is she has the very concrete thing, but she's not sure what the big question is, that this is the example for that big question, right? And we're struggling right now to help her figure out what is that question that allows her to use what she knows about braces is a cool way of illustrating some very cool concept. And I feel like most of you are actually struggling with the opposite, right? Is you have some cool concept and you're trying to figure out what's the specific story I'm gonna tell yeah. to illustrate that. 
And so we've actually got like a reverse engineering problem here, which is we don't know what the question is that she wants to ask that allows her to tell this cool story about braces in a way that that example is a perfect example for this larger concept. And the problem is right now is there, there are a bunch of ways, that, there are a bunch of different ways, questions we could ask. Mm -hmm. But it's, good, it's a good exercise to throw out all these bigger questions because that gets you out of the after school special, right? That gets you out of why do we get braces so that you put up with this trauma so that you can have a healthy, shiny smile and then like thumbs up and, and credits, right? Like that's what you don't want to have a video that's like that. Um, to play the devil's advocate. You don't want to have a video. I, I agree. No, like no, 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 no. I agree. I agree with you. I agree with you. But. Um, you can play off that expectation in fun and interesting ways. Like, I would be perfectly happy to start a video as a parody of an infomercial. Like, I thought parody is different. Than parody of an infomercial. Info, yes, right? yes, 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 yes. Um, I mean, to do the infomercial and then reveal it's a parody. Yeah. Right. But, um, but, but yeah. Like, you wouldn't actually go with the intention of, like, the, the, the infomercial as your tone. No, but, I mean, no, but we'd shoot it and deliver it as, a, as like, we'd, honest to God, infomercial for yeah, the first... Right. 20 seconds or whatever, right. you know, until you establish right. that you're no joking. More than 20 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More the crap out of your audience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you actually have to go a bit over the top of what the normal tone would be to sort of Which signal that you're. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so when I first um, heard Andre say that you know your jaw dissolves, that kind of brings up a lot of images. There's so many movies where there's a focus on teeth destroying mankind. So there's jaws, there's piranhas, there's just, just <laughs> random people with teeth walking around, and that's kind of their main feature. Zombie, and, zombie movies. Yeah, and yeah. we watched um, a movie, uh, a video about you know what makes things creepy, and one of the images was just a teddy bear with teeth, and that was horrifying. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, them I think the scene. idea. Um, so she's kind of making the familiar thing unfamiliar. So um, you can even get away from the idea of you know getting braces. This is something we do, but rather start, you know, with this this monstrous thing that, you know, we dissolve our jaw. Um, and that's a really cool image. And maybe you put it on a teddy bear. Um, you don't even have to kind of associate it with humankind. And then at the end, you come back to the familiar, you know, this is what we do and let the viewer kind of think back and say, oh, wow, this is me doing really cool things inside my body. Yeah, I think, you know, figuring out other examples where essentially bone is dissolved and, and basically listing all of those out, seeing what the differences are, what the commonalities are. And then from there, I think you will have a better sense of what the overall story or big question of the video is, whether it's, whether it's infomercial parody, you know, horror at the dentist, bub teeth, um, teddy bear with the creepy smile, whatever it ends up being. Um, I think the, I think you, you know, you're absolutely right. The challenge is, you know, you have the con you have, you have one concrete example, one really interesting, good concrete example. Uh, and the question is how to, how to get to it in a way that is, you know, authentic and engaging. Yeah. The body morphing concept is very interesting. Yeah. Like breaking, oh, that's the other one, yeah, breaking your legs right. and to get but taller idea, and stuff. The idea of like, because this is, this is a, it, it's a very everyday example of something that's actually like really bizarre of us physically altering our own like image, right, for one reason or another. And people have experimented with like, you know, in certain countries, big feet are not attractive and trying to like swaddle their feet in order to protect them from like women's feet from getting too yeah. big or, you know. And I mean, thinking of what are the ways in which we have either for beauty or for function found ways to manipulate our physical appearance yeah, on a structural or like cellular level, not just on a like going to the plastic surgeon and getting them to fix my nose party kind of like. You know, in a weird way, some of the some of the body modifications that we associate with extremism are the easiest. Like, you get a piercing, I mean, like, well, you know, you just, that's, you're just driving a nail through your ear, so what, big deal. Braces, which everybody thinks are like, you know, uh, yeah, everyone gets braces, are actually this incredibly complicated biochemical process that's happening that's a, a team effort between the hunk of metal in your teeth and your body to reshape the only exposed bones that you have on you. 
You know, like that is. And it's more than just brute force pulling them together, but you're actually like affecting the biochemical interactions that are happening within your body. Yeah. I mean, maybe you start off with that, like say that the common misconception of how this work. But it, until you know where you're going, that doesn't help, right? So I wonder if, since we're in time of we're circling, that maybe, maybe what we need to do is like either have Andrea or all of us come up with a couple on our own of like questions that the braces could be the answer to. I think yeah. Also coming up with a list of other examples that are similar. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that maybe tomorrow we circle back and see if we or you know can can better better explore this because I don't yeah. know that right now we're going to get there. I mean, we have a lot of options that you can toy with. The point of the conversation is that the point of the video shouldn't be, this is how braces work. Right. It's a, a tool that you use to reach the bigger point. And the bigger point has not been established yet, but there are lots of opportunities that, or lots of possibilities that hopefully we've been throwing out. And this thread of like body morph modification is a different thread than the whole making the familiar unfamiliar. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure that you can address all of them in a single video. No, you can't. But they're yeah. all possible options. They're all equally viable options. I would say that on a practical level, how that relates to the script that you've written here, I mean, the studies have shown that having a beautiful smile, like that's a sentence that's um, sort of explaining why we, it's explaining why we get braces. but. Um, and that's not necessarily a point that I think you should eliminate from the video. It's just a point that can come much, much later, right? That it's a... I'd actually argue that that's its own video because the, the whole, I mean, the, this um, is kind of this like philosophical point that, uh, you know, it raises so many interesting questions like, you know, like, well, how important is a smile to the, to, you know, the rest of your face? Is, is symmetry important? You know, like, is, like does, it, does it really actually make people like you more if your teeth are whiter? Like that, so that for me... It's almost like a psychology video. Is this, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a whole separate video. Time has right. done yeah. a whole bunch of different, I think Time Magazine has done like a whole series on beauty and, and, and sort of the physical nature of beauty and yeah. all that. I think tons of popular magazines I always get nervous when we say studies too because like the critical scientist in all of us is like, who? Right? <laughs> <laughs> How legit are they? And are they at Harvard or are they at, you know, Podunk somewhere and the only person in the universe who thinks this? So that's just something I always think about. But I mean just saying that that sentence you can either get rid of entirely in the open I mean I would get rid of it entirely in the opening. Yeah. I think I think like if 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 it for me at this point, I would want to actually, this is what I tell a lot of people who come in my lab for a variety of different communication tasks, is to actually minimize this and not look at it and see if you can come up with an idea that this fits under and then come back to this idea and see if you can somehow repurpose it. But the idea of trying to repurpose this without that bigger concept is not really going to allow your mind to yeah, actually, and that leads me to another point, which is everyone who's gone today, and um, almost certainly the people who have not been subjected to this horrifying treatment, um, uh, you will all need to completely rewrite your next draft from scratch. So when we say redraft a script, we're not saying like change a few words here or there. We're saying start with a blank you know, Word document and start from scratch. Because otherwise, you're going to end up with the same, all the same issues that you know, we talked about. I end up loving like a phrase that you use. We can call, you can do what you call lifting a line, which is to just copy and paste that line once you've got your new structure in place, and that that keeps you from sticking to something that doesn't really work and trying to step it into something that's going to work a little better. Yeah, um, it keeps your mind open that way. Yeah. If there's a line that really sticks with you, oftentimes you will just of your own will rewrite it. You don't even need to copy and paste it. But um, but yeah. Um, we won't get a chance to hit everyone's scripts today, but uh, George can stay until 5 and I can stick around as well. Um, it's about 3.30, so yep. we're we should gonna probably just move into hosting. Do a hosting yeah. mm -hmm. I have to apologize because I have to leave every day at 3.30 to get my son. And so I am sorry. This is my moment I have to leave. But if any of you need to reach me or want to connect with me, email. I will totally get back to you tonight. But I'm sorry that this is always the moment of the day where I have to leave. All right? So awesome work. This is also a totally normal process. I mean, 
George, your script was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, we went back and forth actually three or four times where she kept being like, this is all fascinating information, but what is the point of your script? And as the writer, you are the worst person to like objectively assess what the point of your script is. So having other people talk about it is helpful. And it's a lot easier to edit someone else's work oh, yeah. this than to come up with it on your own. So yeah. It's totally normal. Yeah, I think we, we did eight revisions of my script. And I'm a we professional writer, mine, so, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Defining the point before you get started, like particularly if you're doing a series, you probably want okay. some common theme, and then each episode has a particular point, or I don't know. Now, oftentimes, you know that you 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 have a point in your mind when you start writing, but then as the strip script comes out, maybe there's a there's a better point. Maybe you know you, discussions like these. You, you discover that, you know what, actually this, this point that I had, was thinking of when I wrote the script isn't what I want to talk about. This other point really is. Um, and that usually happens no matter how diligent you are about like, picking the best point that you can before you start writing. And again, it's a slightly different process for like, purely technical instructional videos, like Linda videos, because I remember you emailed me about that. Um, I don't know if you guys have checked it out yet, but we're not going to teach like technical how to use Final Cut Pro, how to use iMovie, but you can go on lynda.com and all MIT students have access to it and they're just purely technical videos. I've listed all the helpful ones in the syllabus. Um, but the objective of that is basically like open your brain, dump the information in, and close the brain. And I mean that in like a very positive way. They're very, very good videos. Um, but that's a totally different objective than like maybe doing a whole series on um, time travel, because there's so much you can talk about that, right? Um, the objective of a series on time travel to pique curiosity among people can also include informing them and transferring knowledge to them, but it's going to be a very different scripting process. Well, I, he I hesitate to say a very different scripting process, but you know, um, the, the priorities that you're going to have are going to be a little bit different than a Linda series, for example.